another season of Backyard Farmer. We are so happy to be back and we cannot wait to hear from you all again as we answer your gardening questions. We are still taking those phone calls this year, so if you need some help with your spring gardening plans, give us a call at 1-800-676-5446. Those great phone volunteers will be happy to help you. If you have pictures to share and they can wait for a future show, send us those emails to byf at unl.edu. We do need to know where you live. We do need to know as much as you can tell us about your issue or your question or your problem. Don't forget to check us out on our YouTube channel. Make sure you also like our Facebook fan page. You might notice that our set looks a little different tonight. That is because we're broadcasting live from the Ron Hull studio, which is currently under construction. We're working to improve the space, including upgraded lighting, modern scenic elements, and a brand new look for shows like Backyard Farmer and Big Red Wrap Up. For more information about the studio renovations and the capital campaign launched to support the project, visit nebraskapublicmedia.org slash imagine. And that will really be way cool. We can't decide whether we look a little bit like the Jetsons or what? Something else, yeah. just not like this. <laughs> so I guess we have to modernize ourselves. We're also changing a lot of the ways that we do things this season. So this might be a little bit uh, shoot from the hip tonight, but we'll see how it happens. And we're going to start right in with questions. And so Jody, you get the very first question of the 72nd year. Are you ready? Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you better be. All right, uh, this is a viewer who says they have black lace elderberries in a part shade moist location in Omaha. They, uh, they got pruned about a month ago because there was a lot of dead in them, which is classic elderberry. They're wondering if these holes were the cause and what can, hap can be done to keep it from spreading. And I think we have three picks on this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this looks like an elderberry borer, which is a beetle and it is a very beautiful beetle if you see them and they do come out and they feed when the plant is in bloom. So they are a dark blue metallic and then they've got a yellow band right um, by, oh, by the base of the wings. And uh, this is not the time to treat though because they're just feeding on the leaves, but it will, the females will lay the eggs on the stem and the larvae will come out and bore into the shoots and then get down into the roots. So what you did by pruning them out is the best thing to do. Prune that out and burn it so they don't um, get back in there. Um, otherwise, after the blooms fall, you can treat with a pyrethroid, something that's labeled for that. Just make sure you um, follow the label. All right, thanks, Joni. And those are big and beautiful and deadly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, you have uh, two pictures on the next one. This is uh, a Lincoln viewer. Six-year-old peach tree, <clears throat> and here is what the trunk looked like, uh, maybe they're saying about two weeks ago. They want to know, is this borers in there, and then will they spread to other peaches? So this can be a borer that those symptoms look like a borer. So there's probably a hole under there, uh, sap dripping out, gummosis is what uh, we see a lot on peach trees. If you don't want it to spread, you can um, treat uh, and spray the bark. This is going to be um, something that's labeled for the fruit trees. This is also common with other stone fruit like um, plums and cherries. That's a stone fruit, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, in the, the best time that you're going to want to treat for that is going to be in uh, July, though. And that's when the, um, the adult and it's a moth, actually, this borer. It's, uh, it looks like a wasp. It's a clear wing moth. And she lays eggs um, down again at, at the base of the tree. But you're going to want to treat closer to July when those eggs are being laid because it's easier to get to the smaller uh, larvae. And then treat again, according to the label, if it's got to be later in July and then in August. And that kind of looks like a, a former peach tree anyway. Mm -hmm. I do have a former peach tree, and so <laughs> I'm very familiar with that. <laughs> All right, that's not a variety audience. <laughs> <laughs> it means it's dead. <laughs> All right, Rock, I, you have one picture on this one. This one, uh, I think this is Omaha. 
got, he gets this wonderful green stripe in his lawn every single year. He hasn't done fertilizer or anything. What do we think this is? Well, we see that when the ground is disturbed for some reason. Maybe they were pulling a fiber optic line or a water line or any other things. And when that soil is loosened up, then the more air gets to the roots and the roots green up faster than everything else, right? So that's, that's a possibility. Um, the, the client indicated that they don't put any fertilizer on. If you want to mask that, or if you just like the kind of the wondery of it happening every year. Uh, but certainly that, that lawn looked like it could use a little bit of fertilizer and don't overdo it, but you might want to mask it a little bit with some uh, fertilizer. But I'm going to say something was trenched into the ground, probably with a puller, so it made a little narrow strip. And it turns green like that. It's pretty intriguing but and perplexing. It's not aliens, and, and it's not a dead snake. <laughs> <laughs> could they overseed with a newer variety that would be green or not? Well, you know, it, it might, if, it, if they got one that was more green, you know, one of the bluegrasses or one of the fescues, maybe. That looks like it's an older bluegrass lawn. Perhaps it's tall fescue, but certainly that's one idea, but I'm not sure that it really needs that. That lawn looks like it would benefit from a little fertility. And if the client doesn't want to mow, then they can just tell their neighbors it's something more exotic than a, than a aerated. Essentially, that's what you've done is band in the lawn. Okay, great. Uh, you have two pictures on the next one. This one comes to us from Sac City, Iowa. And she says she has this grassy weed in her iris bed. And the iris is obviously in, in both a mulch and a kind of a rock mulch. She says it has a very vigorous root system. And what is it and what's the best way to get rid of it? Well, thanks to the viewer for mentioning the root system because that was a helpful in identification. Plus the pictures were good enough that I could see that it uh, um, didn't have the characteristics of downy brome, so I'm pretty confident that's smooth brome, which is a perennial and has a real aggressive, as I said, root system with lots of rhizomes. Um, there are, it's not going to be, it's going to be impossible to dig that up as established as it is. Um, so I'm going to say that that would be a lesson in futility. Um, but what they may want to do is consider a product like Grass Be Gone, um, you know, real colorful name, or Grass Beater, or, or there's another one, um, Grass Getter. These are all available at the various garden stores and, and box stores. And you spray those on, the iris are not harmed. Um, and it's gonna take multiple applications, especially with something like smooth brome, but they can be successful. All right, thanks, Rock. Amy, mm -hmm. you have one here uh, from a viewer, a, a good viewer who might s looks a little bit like rocks, but the question is this appears kind of this oval looking darker green spot in their lawn. Uh, they're not sure what it is. It seems to uh, come back every year and is visible all year long. Any idea what we have going on here? So we talked about a few things off air, and the first thing we want to lean toward is there, that it potentially being fairy ring, um, which is a fungus that's in the soil. But through our conversations, we're leaning away from fairy ring. Fairy ring, typically we don't have that green oval or ring shape all year long. The other trick is if we're looking at fairy ring, we should see mushrooms growing out of there. Um, even if you're mowing it on a regular basis, those mushrooms only take a couple of days to pop out of the ground and be visible. So that would be one big question I have. Are you seeing any mushrooms? If you are seeing mushrooms, then we're definitely dealing with fairy ring. And with management of fairy ring, the best option is to overseed with resistant varieties. And that will take over. If it is not fairy ring, we're gonna end up with the exact same situation that Rock talked about. Most likely something was trenched in aeration wise. And so we would wanna fertilize the mass that green um, and bring up the health of that rest of the turf in that lawn. All right, thanks, Amy. Um, your next one here is this showed up after the last rain in Lincoln. It's in a shady location, but it's really patchy. What is it and is it harmful? <laughs> Oh, this is our wonderful nemesis of powdery mildew. So powdery mildew can develop on pretty much any of our plant species. And this is, is it turf or was it iris? Turf. It is turf. Yep. Um, we're going to see it more in the shaded areas where we have high relative humidity. So we're not getting as much airflow. Overall, powdery mildew will not kill your turf but it isn't as pleasant to look at. There are some resistant varieties, but a lot of times I'm going to be looking at more of uh, air management. How do we get more air in there uh, so the powdery mildew isn't able to get established? You can also do direct blasts of water. It doesn't like free water on the leaf, but then you're going to run into other disease issues with that water. 
Or the other option is if you see this continuously in those shaded areas, maybe this is an area of the lawn that we maybe want to transition into more of a landscape bed and put shade loving plants there versus turf so we don't have to deal with the powdery mildew situation. I sit between two of them, turf. Brock's gonna tell me it needs to stay turf. Elizabeth's <laughs> gonna say, let's move it on over to a landscape bed. So uh, it's really up to what you wanna deal with. All right, uh, Elizabeth, your first one comes to us from Omaha. It's a swamp white oak planted in 2018. It's a south exposure. The tree is healthy. They fertilize it. She says uh, it does not have a central leader. She's wondering, should they go ahead and establish one or let it be, let it be? If you can safely reach um, one of those branches, yes, we could turn it into a tree with a central leader. Um, it looks like there's a fork in there, and so what we would do is we would take the weaker of the two and we would head back. We would only cut a portion of that off, and then next year we would cut a little more off, and slowly we would have it to the point where we would only have one central leader. If it is not safe for you to do so, um, as long as there isn't a really um, narrow branching angle, the tree's gonna do whatever it wants to do and it'll be fine. It's an oak, it's gonna grow really slow. So if it's safe, do it. If not, it's fine. All right, thanks Elizabeth. Uh, you have one picture on this last one. This is a Harlan, Iowa viewer. It's a Douglas fir sapling that he's been keeping in his window. He wonders why he's not getting any fragrance from it because he understands this is the second most fragrant tree after balsam fir. So a lot of times when it comes to these evergreens, they are sun lovers. And so I can tell from that photo that that tree um, isn't getting quite the sun that it wants. It's stretching, it's reaching for that window because it needs just a little bit more sun. Um, and so that's going to be the first and foremost. Secondly, a lot of times we're going to get that fragrance whenever it has been wounded or cut or the needles have been crushed. Um, I don't know if I walk by any, you know, Douglas firs and be caught off guard with their scent. So a lot of times you have to have some kind of um, mechanical damage to it to get that fragrance. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Well, we have some great things planned for you this year and we do hope you'll stay with us as we roll with the changes. Let's take a look at what's new and what's coming your way for season 72. We've already answered a couple of your questions on Backyard Farmer, but let me tell you about all the exciting things we have planned for you this season. We'll be concentrating on helping you turn your landscape into something more edible, whether it's vegetables or trees. We'll be talking about pollinators and perhaps turning some of your turf into prairie species in urban environments. All this and more on this season of Backyard Farmer. We'll help you take care of all of those magnificent trees if you have any. We'll help you choose new ones if you don't. And of course, all those shrubs and perennials and great plants that really help the environment make you a happier person. Maybe you want to grow your own plants from seed or certainly buy them from good sources. We can help you make the great decisions to get the right plants for your landscape. Behind me is the Backyard Farmer Garden, and we want you to be able to see what we talk about on the show. We grow vegetables and flowers. Of course, the All America selections are in that end of the garden. And Terry will be returning as usual to give us that garden minute every single week. We want to get back to answering more of your questions, but a really exciting reminder that we have huge changes coming this year. Just like the environment and everything in it changes, so do we. So stay tuned to Backyard Farmer your absolute favorite show.
You know, Backyard Farmer is committed to helping you grow your own food, keeping up with the latest gardening trends, and of course, helping you find those solutions to your garden problems. Stick with us and you will hear all of this and we'll grow together. All right, questions, Jody. Your next one, you have one picture. Um, this came to us from California, San Diego, and it's a little white shell-shaped object. Is it an insect cocoon and it is attached to a passion fruit vine? It is not an insect cocoon, but it, it is an insect. So that is a wax scale. I've never seen one of these in real life, but thanks for sending that from California. <laughs> um, it's, it looks like a barnacle scale. Yeah. And if you have more questions about that particular scale, I would reach out to the University of California uh, extension and see what they have to say. I know there are many of those, and there are many that are invasive, so um, they would know when the crawler stage is. But if, it, if you just see the one, you can pick that off. If you do end up seeing like defoliation or dieback of your plant, then you'll probably want to treat that. And you can treat with a, a pyrethroid or, um, I don't know, horticultural oil when those crawlers are present. But it's, that's, that's it's a really pretty cool, cool looking it thing. It doesn't even look real. <laughs> All right, you have one picture on the next one. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is a Thanksgiving cactus. Um, she's had it 22 years. This is from Madrid, Nebraska. Started having problems with it dropping leaves, changed location. The leaves look like the picture, but they're not sticky. No webs, but this sort of looks like insect damage. And then, Amy, you get it after Rock answers a question. Oh. Well, it, I mean, some of the coloration could look like spider mite, but if you've had it for 22 years, you probably would either see the spider mites or the webbing, and that would be controlled by some type of insecticide in the, the pot that you can um, do to treat that. Um, otherwise, I would just really look into what Thanksgiving cacti need to have live healthy lives. So um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've got one that doesn't look that great at the office. It's because you don't have any windows in your office. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So there may be an environmental reason. There is not spider mites. All right, Rock, you have uh, uh, two pictures on this next one. This is a Ravenna viewer. He worked on pulling, digging, and spraying this weed all last summer, but here it is again. He did use Roundup last year. Help. It is taking over the yard. Yeah, this is ground ivy. Intriguingly enough, um, some people will misidentify it as henbit because henbit is a winter annual and they flower prolifically this time of year. The henbit uh, has a trumpet shaped flower at the end of the leaf, whereas uh, if you look here and in the second picture, the, the flowers are down in the axles, you know, down like at the, the crotch of the uh, leaf to the stem. So um, at the end of the day, that's how you tell them apart. They're both members of the mint family. Um, ground ivy has a more pungent odor to it rather than henbit, um, and, and uh, it's unpleasant to some people. It Roundup is not a real effective tool for ground ivy, but uh, something containing triclopyr as a uh, active ingredient will do a pretty good job on ground ivy. And, and you have to be persistent because it's got aggressive runners and it can pretty much take over a space. But um, if it's not in a landscape bed where there are other broadleaf weeds, if it's in the lawn or in a mulch bed, I would strongly suggest the use of something like triclopyr. All right, thank you, Rock. You have three pictures on this one. This is really odd. This is Dakota City. Uh, this is weed is taking over the lawn and it is ground hugging and has turned black brown. What is it and how does she get rid of it? Uh, these are the skeletons of prostrate knotweed. Okay. And it dies with the, in the winter, as the viewer mm -hmm. described in her note to us. And uh, it has a little bit of woody growth to it. And um, that's going to be germinating. I think that one was actually set in February earlier right, in the season. Earlier. So yeah. it's probably already germinating and starting to get masked by the germinating seedlings. It's an annual, but you pre-emergent herbicide in the late um, fall, do a pretty good job on that, or early applications of something with 2,4-D in it will do a pretty good job. But once it's uh, aggressively growing, you know, in another month or so, because it's one of the first to germinate, it'll be really hard to control. So jump on it now. But those are the skeletons. The, we call them weed skeletons. <laughs> well, and Dakota City probably is behind us a little ways, I would think, because you got more snow and cold mm -hmm. up your way, didn't you? Oh, then sure then did. they probably are, sure. Yeah, so m might still not be up and green and growing like it is in Lincoln. All right, uh, Amy, you have two pictures on this next one. This was also sent in the winter. Uh, she found a very large fungus on her walk. 
She's never seen one this large, and she saw this in February. So she's wondering what it is. She, she wears a women's size 12 shoe for size reference. It's a really, it's a really big mushroom. And, and I really struggled on what, it, to me, it kind of looks like hen of the wood a little bit. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if it was on a tree or was it just on the ground. Um, the other big question is, you know, you saw it in February, which seems a little unusual, but we have to stop and think. Our soil temperatures have been warm all winter. Uh, yes, we had that Arctic blast in January with negative 50, but we had snow cover even here in Lincoln. And so our soils never got really cold and we had that warm period. And so the mushrooms came up and were happy and living and, and fruiting away. So I wasn't able to pinpoint exactly what it was because it would be nice to know what you found it on, uh, whether it was on a wood, you know, woody material or if it's just in the grass. Um, that makes a difference on identification for me. All right, excellent. It is pretty though. It is We're very worth. pretty. Yeah, okay, uh, Amy, you have two pictures on the next one. This is a Lincoln viewer also. He found it in early March. Mm -hmm. He thought it was a large mushroom, then pulled it up and then three inches in diameter, took some pictures. He thinks it's an air potato, which is an aquatic invasive. It is not an air potato, uh, which is an invasive species in aquatic areas. And last I checked in Lincoln, you're not sitting in water. Um, <laughs> this is actually, it looks like a puffball, mm -hmm. um, a baby puffball. And the trick is you saw that, you know, that root. Um, most of our mushrooms or all of our mushrooms all start with some type of base like that. That's the mycelia and then, then it gets that structure underneath. Puffballs are really nice and easy to see those. The other ones are stinkhorns will do that. This would continue to grow when it gets warmer and continue to mature as the season goes on. So you can dig them up and remove them, but in all reality, they're not gonna cause any damage. They're just gonna be a puffball. When you mow over them, they're just gonna go poof um, and send out all these black spores when you mow them, so. And then you'll have more. And you'll have more. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to, puffballs are edible um, and there's puffball festivals in Wisconsin. Would no, don't eat them when they're black. You eat them when they're white. <laughs> don't eat them when they're black and puffy. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like eating hmm. dust. Yeah, no, you do it when they're white and fleshy. <laughs> All right. Elizabeth, uh, you have two pictures on this first one. This is a, a viewer who has a, this is a three-year-old pear. Uh, he's from Omaha. He does believe it needs to be pruned. He's attached pictures. Uh, I did ask him about the TP, and that was... Uh, to net to hold the squirrels from annihilating the pear tree. So he'd like to know how to prune. So first and foremost, when we're talking about pruning our fruit trees, we need to make sure, especially with pears, that we have a good central leader. And so if you have any that are becoming co-dominant stems, we want to do um, a heading back cut and take one down a little bit, but still leave it attached. Because we still have a fairly small tree, we want to make sure that we're not removing more than one third of the canopy at any one point in time. After we get the central leader, then we're going to make sure we've got the lateral branches kind of you know, spread out like a spoke on a tree. Um, once those are there, then we need to make sure that we're removing any water sprouts, which are going back up straight or branches going back into the canopy or branches that are not gonna help the tree overall. We wanna make sure that we don't prune too much too quickly on a young tree, especially a pear, cause that's gonna make those water sprouts and suckers come on. Um, but just start with those few, few, few steps first, and then we will um, kind of slowly take it from there. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, you have two pictures on the next one. This is uh, in between Papillion and Gretna. Uh, we have a spousal issue here. Her husband uh, removed a large branch from the apple tree and the cut started to veer into the main trunk. She stopped him as soon as she saw it. Did he kill the tree? Or should he kill it? <laughs> he didn't kill the tree, but it looked like the tree had some age on it. Um, looks like it potentially had some co-dominant leaders, um, maybe some included bark on there. Um, so, I mean, all you can do is really watch and wait. We want to make sure that that wound stays open to the environment. We don't want to paint it or tar it or anything along those lines. If the tree's in overall good health, um, we shouldn't see any, any issues from it. But like I said, if it's an older tree, don't be surprised if it's not gonna seal over those wounds. So all we can do now, watch, wait, see what happens. I'm not getting in the middle of that dispute. <laughs> well, and it did look like the one cut was 
you know, an older, mm -hmm. kind of not a very good cut in that tree. So, oh well. Well, you know, we are happy to introduce a new feature to our show. We're going to give you a weather forecast for each week to help you plan out your schedule for important tasks like watering and everything else you need to do in the landscape. So here's Gannon Rush from UNL's High Plains Regional Climate Center to tell us what to expect this week. Thanks, Kim. I'm happy to be here. Looking at the highs for this upcoming week, the state should expect anywhere from the low 50s to the mid 70s. The warmest temperatures will occur on Saturday and Sunday before we kind of cool off next week. Across the state, the warmest temperatures we found out west, predominantly in the North Platte, McCook, and Scotts Bluff areas. The entire state should expect some form of precipitation this week, whether that be rain or snow. This will occur on Saturday and Sunday with the highest amounts expected between Norfolk and Lincoln and out west north of Scotts Bluff. The Panhandle could see some form of snow, while the central and eastern portions of the state could see thunderstorms. If thunderstorms do occur, expect localized amounts that are higher than what is shown on the screen. Soil temperatures for the state are relatively mild in the mid 40s all the way up to the low 50s. They will probably stay the same for the next few weeks until we have a warm up which is expected to occur in the near future. And that's your weekly forecast of the weather. Back to you, Kim. Thanks, Gannon, and we are glad you are on board to help us with the forecast. We uh, have much more in store for you, of course, on Backyard Farmer. Stick around, we'll be right back after these messages. Right now, it is time for the lightning round. All right, Elizabeth, you're up first. You ready? You bet. Okie dokers. We have some uh, viewers who have tulips up, but they just have a leaf or two. Are they going to flower? And if so, when? Or should they dig them, throw them away, or start over? They're probably not gonna flower. You might wanna check and see if they need to be thinned out or start over. All right, uh, we have a North Platte viewer who is wondering, is it time to plant peas, lettuce, any of those leafy sorts of things? Yes, peas can go in the ground in March, so you can go ahead and get those planted. Some of the lettuces, we gotta wait just a little bit longer. Okay, and if you have snow on the ground, you might wanna yeah, hold Yeah, not in the snow. <laughs> All right, uh, we have a Creighton viewer from Hickman who wonders about pruning spireas now. As long as they haven't started to show signs of growth, you can go ahead and you can rejuvenate prune to the ground if you need to. All right, we have a Burwell viewer who wants to know whether Taylor Juniper is an okay um, vertical evergreen to use. Yes. <laughs> we, have, uh, <laughs> we have an Omaha viewer who uh, is wondering about sourcing a redbud from wild stock north of Omaha. Is that a better idea than going south for one? Going north is better. Um, you're gonna have hardy stock and it's gonna be better able to handle our conditions. Excellent, nice job. Okay, Amy. Yep, let's go. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, this is an interesting question from Syracuse. Okay. Is there a way to know if tomato plants purchased were grown from virus indexed seed? They had issues last year. It might be on the tag if they have resistance to those viruses, um, depending on the variety, but otherwise probably not. All right. Um, this viewer didn't say where they're from, but they have arborvita that are showing some dead spots in them. Is there a disease of arborvita or is it just likely winter kill? Arborvita, it's most likely winter kill. Uh, they don't like our environmental conditions here very well. Print them out. Are we uh, seeing cedar apple rust yet? And this is a viewer from Lincoln who, wants, who says the crab apples are starting to flower. Should they spray? If you're in Lincoln and your crab apples are starting to spray, yes, you probably should put those applications on. You threw me off a little bit because I still have snow, so <laughs> <laughs> not thinking about that. All right. Uh, this viewer in Norfolk threw moldy carrots and potatoes into their compost. Will it affect the plants if they put that compost on the garden? Nope, won't it affect it at all as long as your compost is getting up to the right temperatures. All right, nice job. Okay, Rock, you ready? Sure. That was really enthusiastic. <laughs> sure. 
<laughs> okay, we have a Pierce viewer who said their lawn is overrun by sandburrs. Is there a pre-emerge for sandburrs? And if so, what and when? Um, so there is a pre-emerge for sandburr. Most of the pre-emergence will work, probably a pendomethylin-based ones, like a Scott's Halt product. That's not an endorsement, simply one that carries pendomethylin. Um, or a barricade one or a prodiamine one. Both of those will work. Um, it germinates later than crabgrass, so we're going to say, you know, people are getting overly anxious. We're still about two weeks away from optimal timing for crabgrass. Go about a week or two within the next month, and you'll have much better control of sandbur. All right. Uh, we have a viewer who wonders whether they should aerate before or after they seed their lawn. Before, because you make this great little hole as a germination chamber, and the seed falls in there, and it's protected while you're trying to mow. All right. Um, this one wants to know how soon after establishing a new lawn from seed can you aerate? Um, generally, you're not going to aerate in the first year because you've already cultivated it up and you don't have a thatch or a compaction problem yet. So you, generally, we wait a year. Okay. Uh, another one, annual rye. Do you need to till or kill before you seed? Uh, that will, if you let it seed, uh, then you're going to have a bigger problem. So you want to either spray it out and seed into it if you're using it as a nurse crop or um, mow it down really short. Okay. Nice job. It was lightning round. <laughs> You ask really hard questions, <laughs> and I'm old. <laughs> All right, Jody, are you ready? Yes. So, uh, a Gretna viewer, the pending cicada emergence, is it going to be here and when? It's not going to be here, so I don't know when. Our brood's going to be here in 2032. All right. Uh, how about something called the darkling beetle? Is that something that we see here? Because this viewer wants to feed birds live things. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a mealworm. So I don't know if they'd really want the beetle, but the larvae are good. Sometimes those bird seeds have beetle larvae in them. Okay. This is a Hickman viewer who wants to know to what to put on the peaches on an acreage to keep the bugs off. So we assume that's Japanese beetles, probably on the peaches themselves. Yeah, unless we're talking about aphids or any of those other things too. I think no? it's the peaches. I mean, there's a there's a spray schedule that they can look at. Okay. For all, there's a lot of different bugs. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we're getting calls about grubs in lawns now. Yes. No. To treat for grubs. Yeah. And are they even up and active? No. I don't Absolutely think so. not. I don't think so. Yeah. You know, Jody, we had five, four, three. If you'd only answered two, it would have been a perfect numeric sequence, but you had <laughs> to answer to three. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you know, every year we return to the backyard farmer garden to grow those vegetables, ornamentals, fruits, and lovely plants in containers. For our first look this year, we're going to return to the greenhouse to see what's being planned. Here's Terry James to tell us more. excited to be back in the backyard farmer garden again for this year so we're looking forward to 2024 and we're going to have some great exciting things as you can see we have a lot of our plants going we still have a lot of seeds to get started remember we're not really starting some of those warm season crops like tomatoes and peppers and basically until right now so you can see our production is up and going we've got things on heat mats we already have some stuff up and we've divided them, so we're excited to see what's gonna happen. Don't forget, we're an All-America Selection Display Garden, so stop by this summer and check out all those new 2024 winners. We'll also be showcasing them throughout the summer, so make sure you watch the Backyard Farmer Garden Minute each week. and I'm certain we'll have another great season again. We can't wait to get those plants in the ground. There's not much out there right now. We do invite you to visit once our plants get going again, but just to show you that there are already plants springing up, here's Elizabeth with our Plants of the Week. Yes, and we've got some lovely spring, spring bloomers. I can't talk. Um, but I mean, one of the colors that we have a very hard time in the garden finding is something blue. Um, so the one in the front, um, Virginia bluebells, um, what it is is the buds come out and they're pink and then they turn blue. 
Now, the fun part about this plant is, yes, it does self-seed, um, but it's not to the point where it's super aggressive and we have to control it. Um, it's going to probably get about 18 inches tall, maybe in the shade a little taller. Um, but the cool part that I think about this plant is it goes summer dormant. So what it does comes up in the spring, looks beautiful, and then all of a sudden it just kind of goes away for the summer. Um, the other ones that we have in here are going to be our lovely daffodils. Now daffodils are one of the ones, they are a bulb. Um, they are a very consistent rebloomer unless they are getting too crowded. So if you have daffodils, they're not blooming very well, you might need to go in and thin those bulbs out kind of space them out again and then rejuvenate that bed. But two very lovely spring flowers right now. Excellent, thank you, Elizabeth. All right, uh, one pick on this next one for you, Jody. This is from Western Oto County. Uh, found this uh, creature and he was about an inch and a half long, a quarter of an inch long at the wings. And then the, the pictures of, what is this? Oh, this is a ichneumonid wasp. Uh, it's one of those parasitoid wasps, so it developed inside the body of a caterpillar, likely. Or it could have just got in from outside. Well, it still would have uh, <laughs> developed, developed inside. inside another insect, but it goes to light. Uh, we have a lot of uh, different parasitoid wasps, totally normal. If you're having a bunch of them, they're probably taking care of some kind of pest that may be in one of the pots that you brought in through the for the winter. Excellent, all right. Uh, this is a Central City, Nebraska viewer. Wants to know what this is. They started seeing them again in the winter uh, on the furniture. Okay, so the question I had was, is this indoors mm -hmm. in the furniture? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is this is called a longhorn beetle or a cerambicid. Uh, it's a, a wood borer, so very similar to the elderberry borer. It's got long antennae. Um, I'm not sure which uh, species this is, but I would think that it's can't, coming out of firewood, so they will, I guess, infest dead wood. So if you've got extra firewood that's inside, take those outside and just release the ones that are coming out. All right. Because um, that's not, not normal to be on furniture. Okay. Uh, we have three pictures on this one. This is a viewer who is concerned about poison hemlock. And she's, uh, she's wondering um, how to manage it because they have chickens and dogs and kids and she wants to get rid of it quickly. So first thing, make sure it's poison hemlock. And I think they did a good job in some of their pictures. You can see it close up because, you know, it, it, as it matures, it'll get uh, purple and red spots on it. Uh, but it also is not hairy. The stems are not hairy. But the ones that are, if it's got hairy stems, then you know it's not poison hemlock and it's probably wild carrot or something like that. So let's just make sure we know it's poison hemlock. If it is, though, there's a lot of bad going on in this batch, right? It, uh, um, all parts are poisonous. Um, animals can ingest it. And if you ingest it, it can be toxic even to humans. And actually kids use the hollow stems because it has hollow stems at, at one point, point in time to make whistles. And then they would have it in their mouth and they'd get sick as well. So um, she, she mentioned digging. You can certainly dig it, but you're going to be heavily protected rubber gloves, the whole nine yards. And then you can dispose of it, wrap it in a plastic bag and to dispose of it um, in, in your in your garbage. Um, some people like to spray it. The only trouble with spraying is, is that it's still got toxins in it even after it's been sprayed. So if the dog or the chickens got into it, then there could be some problems. So I'm not a big fan of spraying. There are chemicals that will work on it. Roundup or a Roundup 2 vortig combination is well known. But with those animals, I'd be really sure to eradicate as much as you can by hand digging and disposing of that and make sure you're well protected when you do it. All right, Rock, you have one picture on this one. Uh, this is a viewer who has a prairie NRD land and uh, she's disturbed the soil. She's got a lot of uh, seeds that are, are plants that are good. She's wondering what this is. Uh, this looks like a seedling shepherd's <coughs> purse to me. Shepherd's purse is a winter annual, um, prolific producer of seed. Um, it, you know, overwinters as a rosette and then it comes up and there'll be a, a pretty nasty seed, not nasty, but a prolific seed producer um, that it stocks up. So I would consider um, keeping those mowed or uh, or even pulling them up if you can, if they're not too bad. But that's uh, shepherd's purse. I'm pretty confident that's what it is. If nothing else, I'm pretty confident it's a, one of the winter annuals. So you probably don't want them as a desirable species. Um, they're just not, they're prolific seeders and they can be marginally invasive. All right, uh, Amy, uh, back to the cactus mm -hmm. from Madrid, your turn. 
Um, this one again showed some really strange things on leaf drop the, and, and kind of there you can really see what's going on with kind of the joints where those um, are attached. So I was leaning toward that this is potentially botrytis blight. Botrytis can occur on many, many plants and when we have humid environments <clears throat> is when we're going to see botrytis. So the question I'm going to have with your Thanksgiving's cactus, was it near a humidifier this winter that could have increased that uh, relative humidity around it? Um, the biggest thing for it is as long as we control the humidity, the botrytis bite isn't going to be an issue. Um, if you're having really major concerns with it, uh, you could always send a sample into Kyle for him to take a closer look at it underneath the microscope to be on the safe side to really identify is it botrytis or is there another disease going on there. All right, thanks, Amy. Uh, this is a Loop City viewer for this picture. She has an egg mass, or she's saying an egg mass, on a lime. So this is obviously inside. It's a 30-year-old lime, not an egg mass. It is not an egg mass. It's a spot of some sort. Um, I did do a little bit of investigation on limes. I don't know a lot about Lyme diseases. There are a variety of fungal diseases that can develop on limes, but there's also a calcium disorder that will give you like a star-shaped lesion on it. And from the picture, I couldn't tell if it was really star-shaped. Um, I don't want to lead you down the track of you needing to treat it with a fungicide. If it's just one leaf, I would just remove that leaf. Um, but if you're having it on multiple leaves, this would be one of those again that we want to send into Kyle um, to make sure is it actually sporulating or could it be that calcium issue that's going on that we could correct with nutrients. All right, thank you, Amy. Two pictures uh, for you, Elizabeth, on this one. This comes to us from Omaha. She left a big pot upside down on top of a daffodil and it came up half chartreuse and half green. Uh, she's, she's wondering, um, gosh, is that going to green up and turn into a daffodil? As soon as it's exposed to light, yes, the chlorophyll will start working and it'll start to turn green um, and it's gonna probably bloom. It's a daffodil, they're pretty tough. So, yep, it's probably fixed itself already. All right, <laughs> thanks. One more picture. Uh, so this one is an autumn blaze maple, about 10 years old. He just noticed this long, thin split, wondering how concerned he should be. This is Omaha. So more than likely, what we're looking at is frost crack. And it's probably gonna be on the south or west facing side. It happens a lot on these smooth bark trees like maple. Um, the only thing we can really do at this point in time is make sure that the tree is in overall good health. Um, so making sure that it gets about an inch of supplemental moisture a week. We avoid fertilization. We leave it open to the environment. One question I would have is I'd like to see what that trunk looks like where it enters the ground. Right. Um, if we don't have a nice root flare, there is the possibility it could be a repercussion of it being planted too deep. So that would be one question that I would have. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. Well, you know, I told you earlier that we were going to be looking at pre-emergence, that's next week. Right now, we're going to get some tips on sending pictures in to the program. Submitting a good picture to Backyard Farmer is critical to helping us help you get the answers you're looking for. Here's a few basic tips to taking and submitting good pictures to the show. Most cell phones have a camera, which means taking pictures shouldn't be a problem, but before you submit the picture, make sure it's in focus and framed up to the issue you have a question about. Avoid altering the picture you took by using filters or cropping. If the picture needs adjustment, our staff will do that prior to airing. Wide shots are okay to show something going on in a landscape, but close-up pictures of an insect or disease problem or a weed will help us identify the issue. It's also good to include a ruler or some other identifiable object in the picture so we can get a good idea of the scale. When submitting, give us as much information as you can about your question and don't forget to tell us where you live. When you're ready to send us a picture, attach them to an email and send it to byf at unl.edu or use the Facebook Messenger app. Finally, always keep in mind we get hundreds of submissions each week, making it impossible to answer everyone's question on the air.
We do hope you'll take those tips in mind and send us some great pictures this season. It makes this easier for us to answer your questions. We will talk about those pre-emergent tips next week when it's closer to time. All right, we have time for a few more questions. Uh, Jody, this is uh, one picture. <laughs> we went back and forth, little mounds on a farm lane, thousands of them, clumpy mounds of dirt over a 3 16th inch hole that goes four inches down. What to do other than wait for Dennis next week? Well, the, <laughs> wait for Dennis next week. <laughs> <laughs> we just don't know. Well, we thought worms were crawdads, but duh, we don't know. <laughs> All right. We'll wait for Dennis. Yes. All right. Uh, you've got three pictures on the next one. This is from Western Oto County. He uh, found this. He's calling him Whitey. I couldn't tell if he was just emerging as his wings almost appeared moist. He didn't like the sunlight, didn't fly. About an inch long, he took some really good pictures of this. So we have three pictures of this beautiful little creature. Whitey's really cute. This yeah. is a Virginian tiger moth and it probably did just emerge. So they pupate um, through the winter. You know, the yellow woolly bears, those little caterpillars that are really fuzzy and bristly, um, that's what they turn into. So. Really? Yeah. yeah, I can't remember seeing a yellow woolly bear for a long time. Well, the time. yellow woolly bear could be yellow, could be brownish. Could um, be black. Yeah, they could, and they eat all sorts of things that are really low to the ground. So you'll probably see them in the fall, mm -hmm. and then that's what they look like. Nice. Okay, uh, the next one here, I think this is a Lincoln viewer. A very old scotch pine has these masses, pitch masses on the trunk. They're wondering, would this have been an insect? Can they do something about it? Yeah, so this is uh, like classic symptoms of Zimmerman pine moth. So right now, uh, about now, it's April, right? So uh, this is when the larvae become active and crawl in, like crawl out and into the tree. So right now is the time to treat. Another time to treat would be in August because they, the larvae will go in and feed and you can't get to them. And so in August is when the moth comes out and lays eggs. So uh, there are things labeled for treatment. It's a trunk spray and that's going to be like a pyrethroid or a clarinthronil pool. You can use that one as well. All right. Um, hate to lose a big tree like that. Okay. Um, three picks for you, Rock, on this one. Uh, oops, I lied. Just one. <laughs> <laughs> Just one on this one. This is again our, our viewer who has the prairie land wondering about something else to identify at that NRD land. Do we know what this one is? Yeah, this is Dame's Rocket, um, which is a um, common mixture and wildflower mixture. It's not native to the North America. It's uh, native to Eurasia, um, but it came here in like the 1600s. So it's been here a long time. It's kind of a showy little biennial or short-lived perennial. It's got a really pretty flower on it. It was used in uh, roadside mixes. So you used to see it along the highway a lot in, in Nebraska along the interstate. And people always asked what it was, but it's it's a keeper. If you like the, its appearance, just realize that it does produce a lot of seed and it can uh, it can be kind of a bully sometimes, depending upon the situation in your bed. So just be aware of that. All right. Um, two picks on the next one. This is a Lincoln viewer who's asking what happened. <laughs> the lawn does this every year. Yeah, quit mowing in the same direction. Um, those are mower tracks, and you compact the soil. Compacted soil warms up quicker, so it turns green faster. So just alter that mowing pattern or consider running an aerator across that lawn a couple times this spring. All right. And two picks on this one also. This is a, a, a viewer who had major construction done on the house. And then this, the first one is apparently the dirt with all the acorns from two huge oaks. And then the fine grading ended up looking like the next one. And it, he's wondering, is this good enough for laying down seed? And will the acorns be a problem? Uh, so let's answer the first part. Basically, that's a great seed bed. Um, you know, it's, it's good for getting the seed in. We always want to cover the seed with something. Um, or drill the seed in, uh, so cover it with a mulch. Um, I think you did that this last week on one, oh, on yeah. a, <laughs> with, with your son's yard. Um, but uh, you want to cover it or do something with that and then keep it wet. But that's a pretty good seed. But the, the oak things themselves, you know, except for being a projectile when you do mow and getting shot around because they'll dry out a little bit. But oak seedlings can come up in a yard and they don't tolerate mowing at all, right? So we just mow them and um, that you don't need any herbicide, you don't need any of that, you don't really wanna use, aggressively use herbicides in a young lawn anyway. So great seed bed, good to them, get the seed in the ground and don't worry about the, um, 
the oak seedlings. And how often should they water it? Uh, they should be watering that if it's, if it's really warm, that sometimes two to three times a day. For a long time, short uh, time? No, no, you know, three to five minutes just to get the surface wet till it germinates. Once it pops, uh, then you can back off to maybe one time a day and then over the course of a couple of weeks, you're only on, you know, one or two, three times a week. Um, then when it's got a root system on it where you can't pull it out of the ground readily, uh, you can back off to about once a week. Great, thanks. All right, uh, Amy, two pictures on this one. This is a Lincoln viewer. You can see what she's talking about here. My Canada Red Choke Cherry has these black things in it. They seem to be getting larger. This is our wonderful friend, Black Knot. Mm -hmm. uh, fungus, very common in all of our stone fruits. Um, the best thing you can do is just prune it out. There's nothing we can do f to prevent it from occurring. Just prune it out so you don't have to look at the nasty blackness. All right, uh, one picture on this one. This is an Omaha viewer. Uh, he, he noticed his tree looked dead at the top, the spruce. He thought it got struck by lightning, but it seems to be moving down the tree. What is this? Oh, uh, this is that dreaded case of cytospora canker that we typically see in spruce. Um, a fungal infection that occurred through a wound, whether it's insect or hail damage, and it plugs up all the vascular systems so water and nutrients can't move into that tree. It does eventually move its way down. So it depends on how soon you want to remove that tree. The tree will decline and continue to decline and die eventually. Um, so it's up to you on how soon you want to remove that and replace it with a new tree this year or next year. All right, thanks, Amy. You have one more. Uh, this is a viewer who has red twig dogwood. Just sent one picture, but they're saying, you know, they've got a whole hedge of these. <laughs> is this canker and what do they do about this it? This is 100% canker and right now it's a great time. Any canes that are showing that, we're gonna prune them out and remove them. Dogwood is one of those we can prune fairly heavy and it's still gonna be fine. All right, excellent. Elizabeth, uh, three pictures on this one. This is a Blair viewer, has 25 year old U hedge. Uh, he faithfully prunes, but now they're larger. He's wondering if he can cut them back, essentially removing all of the green needles at one time without killing them and then forcing new vegetation to grow. So normally we don't recommend rejuvenation pruning on our ewes. Can it be done? Yes. Do we recommend it? No. <laughs> um, because if we prune it so heavily, um, what's gonna happen is you're hoping and crossing your fingers that those buds down on the woody portion are gonna break. There's no guarantee when you cut that much growth off that it's going to break bud. And for two, it's going to stress those shrubs. Um, and it's gonna take several years for them to completely recover. So you can prune them um, like he's been doing twice a year, um, pruning them back to maintain that size, but we really don't recommend rejuvenation pruning back to 18 to 24 or anything like that. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. You have, uh, excuse me, one picture on this one. This is a viewer who planted nine seedlings and then uh, she's from Fremont. The, this winter an animal ate practically all the needles off these. Are they dead? Not yet. <laughs> um, I don't have much faith that they're going to make much of a recovery. The only hope for new growth is gonna be any new candles that it puts on. So it's gonna look like a lion's tail where it's gonna be nothing and then a poof in the end. Um, so I, they could leave them in a little while longer, but they might not be aesthetically pleasing when they are all grown up. <laughs> All right, uh, quickly on this one, this is a viewer who is always fighting weeds in the garden, and they're wondering, is there a cover crop they can grow alongside the vegetables during the growing season? So what that's called is a living mulch. And there are several things that you can do. You can use some of the clovers, whether that be the red clover or some of the other clovers out there. Um, other things like buckwheat, or I do know of some commercial producers, what they do is they plant rye, let the rye come up and then knock it down. And then that acts like a mulch as well. So there are a lot of options for a living mulch in the garden. Realize you're still gonna have to water it quite a bit. They're gonna steal some of the moisture from your vegetable crop, um, but it will help to shade and keep the weeds down. And just so you know, viewers, that was a picture of our cover crop and that was oats that were supposed to die this winter and they didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Jody, we did get something back uh, in quickly that will answer just this one question. It's a Lincoln viewer. Are chiggers out now? We have 20 seconds. No. <laughs> 